Welcome to Easter 2020. We know it's different this year. We're all at home. We're watching on the computer, watching on the TV, watching through a DVD disc. But we want you to know, as one in the body of Christ, we are together. As we celebrate this time, let's not forget, He's on His throne. That grave is empty. And no matter what the world may be throwing at us, no matter how bad epidemics and other tragedies may spread, our God is in control. And we relax and we love that. Let's remember during this time that we continue, as you've done such a good job of, uh, continue supporting the church. You can give through the church website at travisbaptist.org uh, forward slash giving. Uh, you can give through the church app. You can give through the United States Postal Service, just mailing it in. Or you can drop it off by the church. If no one's here, there's a mail slot in the red door by the office entrance. You can just drop it in there. We check that several times a day. And I don't think we've lost one yet. So uh, we are grateful for how supportive you've been, for how generous you are. We also have had some good donations into the Family in Need Fund. We've been helping some families with HEB cards. Some have been going out and buying groceries for them. You guys are so good. We praise the Lord for how faithful and generous you are. We don't know how long this is going to last, but Easter Sunday is here. We're going to celebrate Jesus, and we hope you join in. During the service today, we will have a point in time where we have the Lord's Supper. It's going to be kind of in the middle of the service. So you may want to, as soon as you're done watching these opening announcements, uh, run over and get you some, uh, if you don't have any unleavened bread in the house, maybe you got crackers, flour tortillas, something like that. And anything to qualify as fruit of the vine, if you've got some juice, whatever flavor, if you don't, just pretend, all right? You know, the, the, the real miracle of the Lord's Supper is not that the elements are transformed into His actual body and blood. What happens is, is that as we remember, He renews us. He reaches inside us, blesses us. We are refocused. We are strengthened. So uh, it's in worshiping Him and remembering what He has done that makes a difference. So be ready. Get your elements ready so that about halfway in, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We've got a special service today. Um, we've got four specials that are going to help us tell the story of Easter and uh, Julio Garcia is going to open us up with a song about how we pass it on, that this story has passed across millennia. And as we each one of us shares with someone, it keeps going forward. Ted Humphrey is going to bless us with a beautiful rendition of I Believe in a Hill called Mount Calvary. And then uh, Alicia Byrne will be singing Via Dolorosa, uh, followed up by Dale Kerr with special music at the end. And I'm not allowed to announce the title because it's a surprise for Donna. So, um, sit back, enjoy, stand up if you want to, shout, praise, pray, kneel, all those things. While we worship the Lord together on this Easter Sunday, may God bless you as we seek Him. My name is Kirk Kirkland, and this is the story the hardest thing my family and I ever attempted. Uh, we were crazy enough to leave everything to move to Cincinnati to plant a church. My wife was nine months pregnant. We just had enough money to kind of pay the rent and survive and put food on the table. We only had just a few pieces of furniture. I remember we had a dining room table, a bed, and just somewhere to lay our, our child. We did not know one person who lived in the city. We didn't have a denomination. We didn't have a network behind us. We were very much on an island, but we were so compelled that we were um, following Jesus. And we advertised for our first service on uh, Easter of 2013, and 66 people from the city showed up on that very first day. I got counsel from another pastor who had made a similar journey. And he says, have you ever heard of North American Mission Board and support what you're doing of planting multiple churches? So we re-looked at what it meant to be to be a missionary. We realized that we didn't have to do it alone. And so we voted to plan another church and to join the Southern Baptist Convention. We said that let's do this again. What we've seen God do, God can do it again in the suburbs. And so we committed to planning the second church. Now we're a part of a wider community and family, and we know that we're better together. 
um, the training that we've received is the way that we plant churches. When you give to missions, we plant the next church, we go to the next town, we go to the next village. And when you give, lives are changed, plain and simple. Good morning. We are so glad you've joined us this Easter Sunday. And today we are going to talk about why we celebrate Easter. Stop and think for a minute. Easter is the day we mark as the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. On Friday of Holy Week, Jesus was nailed upon that cross. He was, gave his life for each of us as a sacrifice for our sins and was laid in that tomb. They rolled the big old stone across from it, left a Roman guard there, and sealed it. But by the time Sunday rolled around, the guard had fled, abandoning their duties. The tomb was found open and empty. And then Jesus was seen, first by the ladies, first by Peter and John. He was seen by all the disciples. He was seen on the road to uh, Emmaus. He was seen at one point by over 500 people. Jesus was alive. Those who were cowering in fear, a movement that was expected to die with his death, grew and spread across the world. Why? Because he rose from the grave. Why is Travis Baptist Church here these hundred something years? Why are you a Christian, a child of God? Because Jesus rose from the grave. If that single event did not happen, none of us would be together today. None of us would even probably have relationships with each other. We might not be friends at all just because we might never have met except for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a story, his death, his resurrection, that has been shared through the Holy Scriptures, inspired by God, and passed down from person to person through generation to generation. Over 2,000 years, that story has spread, and it's come to you. And the only way this story keeps spreading is if we keep sharing it. Let's be reminded that this spark that started so long ago on that first Easter morning still is a fire that burns brightly in our hearts. Hello, church. I'd like to do this song here that's an old song, but uh, you remember it, Sing Along at Home. Uh, it's a song that uh, I think about, uh, I was thinking about uh, how a spark can turn into a fire and how if we could only share the Word of God, just a spark can actually set us on fire with the Lord's, uh, just the Spirit of the Lord. And I just pray during these times that we're going through with the coronavirus, how it's just a, a virus and it's spreading so fast. Can you just imagine if this was the Word of God that could spread so fast, so rapidly? But uh, this song reminds me of, of how the, the Lord's Word can spread it's just by a little spark from each one of us. Anyway, it's called Pass It On. It only takes a spark to get a fire going And soon all those around can warm up in its glowing that's how it is with God's love Once you've experienced it You spread His love to everyone You want to pass it on What a wondrous time is spring When all the trees are budding The birds begin to sing the flowers start their blooming that's how it is with god's love once you've experienced it you want to sing it's fresh like spring you want to pass it on i wish for you my friend the happiness that i've found you can depend on Him, it matters not where you're bound. 
I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. Thank you and God bless. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. Matthew, chapter 20, and we are going to read verses 17 through 19. Matthew, the first book of your New Testament, chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this. What a glorious truth it is that it was your plan that Jesus, upon going to Jerusalem that Palm Sunday, Riding into town as a king, yet leaving town as a condemned man. Mocked, scourged, beaten, crucified, and dead. But it didn't stop there. Then he rose from the dead on the third day. You, God, in giving us this resurrection. You, Jesus, in overcoming death. You, Holy Spirit, in making this all available to us and true to us speaking to us, revealing it to us. Lord God, all of this is so wonderful to know. Let this gospel message be on our lips. Let it be in our hearts. Let nothing stop it from spreading. We say these things in the name of Christ. Amen. As we look at this passage and as we think of Easter and as we look at our world situation, I'm up here at the church by myself sharing this message. You're at home with your family, maybe by yourself. Maybe you're in the car listening to this through your, your car's Bluetooth system. Maybe you're watching the DVD on a day other than Easter. Maybe all of these things. But the fact of the matter is, we're bound together by this one simple thing. This gospel, this story that came about, this deed that happened, that has passed across cultures, it's passed across centuries, it's crossed continents. This message that we find in Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, that the Son of Man would be delivered to men, betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they would condemn him to death and deliver him to Gentiles to mock and scourge him, and then he would rise again. This message, not even the gates of hell can stop it. Coronavirus number 19 cannot do anything to stop this message. There is neither height nor depth nor anything out there that will stop the story of Jesus Christ going out. And this story was not an accident. We notice in the passage the first thing that happens is that he would be betrayed. Jesus Christ, God the Son, came down among us, born of the Virgin, taking on human flesh. It was God's eternal plan for him to come. In fact, in Zechariah chapter 13, um, the, the prophet asked, it's a prophecy about Christ, where they say, what are these wounds on your hands? And he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. One of several prophecies about Christ, that he would be betrayed and killed by his own people. That the death of Christ was a betrayal that was planned in Scripture. It was a betrayal that was planned as part of our path of salvation. From the earthly standpoint, it looks like a tragic backstabbing on a level with Julius Caesar. But from the heavenly perspective, it was God's eternal plan. Prophesied, planned, purposeful, 
so that Jesus would indeed, as he told his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem. We will go to Jerusalem. This passage in verses 18 and 19, the basic words of it are repeated at least six times elsewhere in the Gospels. On six occasions, Jesus telling his disciples, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. It was hard to believe, but that betrayal was coming. In fact, if you will remember at the Last Supper, how shocked they were when he said, one of you is going to betray me. And they all sat around and go, Lord, is it me? Is it me? Can't possibly be. Peter jumps up and shouts, there's no way, Lord, I'd ever betray you. And then, of course, Jesus told him, Peter, you'll deny me three times before morning comes. But they crucified him. He had angered society. He had angered the legalistic leaders. He had angered them with his teachings, with his presence, and with his popularity. And from the earthly standpoint, they said there's only one thing we can do, and that's get rid of him before we lose. And from the heavenly standpoint, it's not like things are spinning out of control. It's not like it's gotten away from God. It's exactly what he planned that would happen. That the very people Jesus came to reach would turn on him. The very people with whom Jesus had his roots. He was Jewish. They called him rabbi. They recognized him as a teacher. A man who knew the scriptures. But that was the problem. They only saw him as a man. They did not realize he was also God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. God with us. Prophesied from their ancient book of Isaiah to come among us and be our Savior. We believe so strongly that this was a plan. This betrayal was not an accident because it's our gift of salvation. That this life with its great mystery will one day will come to an end. Oh, but faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my friend. I believe that the Christ who was slain on the cross has the power to change lives today. Oh, for he changed me completely. A new life is mine. That is why at the cross I will I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary, and I believe no matter the cause, 
hill of Mount Calvary, such a special, beautiful place, such a gory, disastrous place, covered in blood, but it was the blood that saved us. It was a place of an unjust execution, an innocent man put to death by the state. Jesus was condemned. The trial was a mockery of the legal system. He was sentenced to death, marched up that hill with his cross, and nailed to it. And as, again, from the earthly standpoint, we look at it and say, this is horrible. In fact, there's a book out there entitled, The Murder of Jesus Christ. I don't think we should ever think of it as a murder. It was indeed a sacrifice, an offering. If you take away God the Father, if you take away the hope of heaven, if you take away the work that His blood accomplished in cleansing us of our sins, yes, it was a murder. The execution of an innocent man. It was just another travesty in history. But because He was God, this condemnation becomes incredibly meaningful. Welcomed into town as a king, condemned as a traitor. What all can change in just a week of public opinion but that is the sinfulness of man that we can love it one moment and hate it the next and isn't that why we need a savior we're just like him we can get all excited about certain things and doing the right thing and helping our neighbor and man four weeks into quarantine i'm ready to strangle someone we change quickly our sin makes us selfish They wanted a king who was going to come into town and and, and rout out the Romans. But instead, they got a man who got everybody upset, turning over money tables, telling them that that temple was going to be torn down and in three days rebuilt. They were all angry with him. And they had to make stuff up to condemn him. They had to hire witnesses. They had to pay people to say it. They even had trouble finding people who would. But they condemned him. It says also in Matthew 20, 18, not only was he condemned, he was delivered to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. See, our sin was too blatant to just let him die. Our sin was too ferocious, too vengeful to just let it go and let him have pass gently into eternity. No, we had to humiliate him. Our sin caused him to be humiliated, mocked, beaten, scourged, whipped, the crown of thorns. Many times they would just tie a guy to that cross, let him hang there, and over days he would die. But our Lord, no, they, they pierced him. Now, you think it's cruel. They drove nails into him when they didn't have to. In a sense, yes, but at the same time, again, that was the prophecy. That he would be bruised for our iniquities. He would be wounded for our transgressions. He would be pierced. They would look upon him whom they pierced. He hung among those thieves. Condemned, not just as a sinner, but condemned with the sinners. One thief on the right hand, one on the left mocking him but he did that for you and me we as Baptists we celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember his death to remember what he did and what he went through upon that cross we're going to celebrate it here in a moment this is a good chance again if you haven't already to get your elements together But we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together and we will remember His body and His blood. As you take your bread and your cup, 
We want to think for a minute, change gears just a little bit. We're not changing the theme at all, but back in John chapter 2, the Gospel of John, Jesus was at the wedding of Cana. And in a sermon I recently heard by Tim Keller, a famous pastor up in New York City, and he got this from a book he read. But uh, Jesus, when asked by his mother to turn water into wine, he said, woman, what have I got to do with this? Almost as if Jesus did not want to fulfill his mother's request at that wedding to turn the water into wine. Why did it upset him? Because he said to his mother, what have I got to do with this? My hour has not yet come. Now that phrase, my hour, is very significant in the Gospel of John. His hour, the hour, is referred to several times, and every time it's, it's, it's mentioned, Jesus is referring to his trip to the cross. In John chapter 2, verse 4, at the wedding, he says, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. We come to John chapter 7, verse 30. The people, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. Chapter 8, no man laid hands on Jesus, for his hour was not yet come. Jesus answered them in chapter 12, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And in verse 23 of John chapter 12, well, My soul is troubled, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this hour, I can't, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. This hour is all about his crucifixion. We read in chapter 13, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Jesus, in his priestly prayer of John chapter 17, the night before he died, he said, Father, the hour has come. So in referencing my hour has not yet come at that wedding, he's saying to her, it's not time for me to die yet. That's kind of weird, isn't it? But what about this? And this is what Mr. Keller referred to from the, the previous author. What if every time Jesus looked at wine, he was reminded, as the Old Testament speaks, of the cup of God's wrath. He was reminded by the water jars, that they would be filled with wine of his impending death. And, and it's interesting, what they put the wine in at that wedding were water jars that were used for people to be ritually cleansed. So in other words, the wine was to be poured into that which was supposed to cleanse. Now let's tie it all together. This cup is a picture of the blood of Christ. Is it possible that every time Jesus looked at wine, whether in a glass, in a cask, it brought back to him, I am here for the purpose of pouring out my life, suffering the cup of God's wrath, and writing that new covenant in my blood. Maybe every time we look at a glass, a cup filled with wine, with fruit of the vine, whichever juice is your preference. Stop and think. Does it remind you of the blood of Christ? That he was betrayed and condemned upon that cross. What agony awaited him? Down the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day the soldiers tried to clear the narrow streets, but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating, there were stripes upon his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa, called the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love. Down the Via Dolorosa 
soldados le habían pasado a Jesús, mas la gente se acercaba para que la feria para de la cruz. Hoy había dolorosa que sabía del dolor, como vea vino Cristo el Rey y Señor, y fui en quien quiso ir por su amor, por ti y por mí, por la vía dolorosa al Calvario y a morir, the blood that would cleanse the souls of all men who made his way to the heart of Jerusalem. Down the Via Dolorosa, called the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to Calvary. Let's pray and bless the elements. Father, we thank you that you gave us your Son and his broken body upon that cross let us never forget the high price paid for our salvation it is in his holy name we say it amen the night he was betrayed jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me bless the cup our Lord and our God we could never say thank you enough that you gave your life your blood your body for our salvation so that at a time like this we would have no fear we would have pure and perfect confidence that we are your children and that we have a home with you we praise you for this and we say it in the name of Christ, amen. Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took the cup, blessed it, and said, take this and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Our passage continues. The Son of Man will be betrayed. He will be condemned and delivered. And the third day, He will rise again. The suffering Jesus went through upon that cross, the agony that he, as He writhed in pain, crying out, My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? All of that coming down on top of Him. The darkness because His Father has turned His back on Him. The thirst He felt. The, the betrayal he felt, the pain he felt, looking down at the very men killing him and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. All of that coming down on top of him. But Jesus was raised. When he finally gave up his spirit, when he quit moving, when he said, it is finished, and then cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When his work had been done upon that cross, he died. To make sure he was dead, a soldier came up with a spear and ran it up into his ribs, into all these vital organs. Now back in, in 30 A.D., they didn't have antibiotics. They had very few surgical skills. Basically, a, 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 a wound that we might be able to be recover from these days was automatic death back then. And for sure, as that spear came through and piercing 
perhaps kidney, spleen, stomach, lung, all of those things, organs, as it rammed up into his side to make sure he was dead. His blood came out. The plasma had separated uh, from the red blood cells. That's why it says it ran, you know, water ran out. That would be the, the, the separation of it because he had died. His blood began to separate. He was as dead as dead could be. But three days later, they took him down off that cross. They laid him in that tomb. They rolled the stone up, and for the very purpose of preventing what happened, they stationed a Roman guard there so that, A, nobody would come and steal the body, and his disciples run around saying, oh, he's alive again, he's alive again, and B, they, to, to make sure that he stayed in that tomb, even if he did come to life. Well, you know what happened. That stone rolled away. Battle-hardened soldiers fled that knew they were going to get a death sentence for uh, fleeing that tomb, abandoning their, their post. Oh, they were going to lose everything, but they were fearing for their lives. That tomb was empty. It seems incredible, but it was. Driving nails in my hands, laugh at me where you stand. Go ahead and say it isn't me. The day will come when you will say, Cause all right. Yes, I'll rise again. Death can't keep me in the ground. Go ahead and mark my name. My love for you is still the same. Go ahead. Bury me, but very soon I will be free, cause I'll rise again. Ain't no power on earth can tie me down, yes I'll rise. Death can't keep me in the ground. Go ahead and say I'm dead and gone. But you will see that you were wrong. Go ahead, try to hide the sun, but all will see. I'll come again. Ain't no power on earth can keep me back. Yes, I'll come again. Come to take my people back. Jesus was raised. The story continues that beyond all doubt, he was seen by over 500 witnesses at some point. 
He was alive. And again, as we said in the beginning, the reason we all know and love each other, the reason we are here as Travis Baptist Church, the reason we are Christians is because he came out of that grave. What a glorious thing. What does it mean for us? It's there in your bulletin if you've got a copy. What does it mean for us that that Jesus rose from the grave? It means that everything he said was true. When he said, there's no way to the Father except through me, that was true. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and life, that was true. When he said, whosoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life, that is true. All of it. Every single word. It would have been one thing to say those things and not died. It would be another thing to say those things and die and not come back to life. But to be able to say those things and be definitely put to death in front of many witnesses and then show yourself alive. Not as a half-dead, recovered-from-a-coma person, but someone who is strong enough and powerful enough to inspire others to leave everything behind and let that spark change the world. They passed it on everywhere they went. Everything he said was true. And, 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 you know, thinking about that too, I think our second thing we need to realize that if we needed a Savior so badly, if we were so sinful, we had to have the kind of Savior who not only died in our place, but had to defeat death for us also. We are so sinful that we must be in bad shape that he had to die and be raised. But aren't you glad he did? I think a third thing we learn from the resurrection that it means for us is that we've got to remember dying leads to living. There was no avoiding that cross. Jesus came for that purpose. Jesus prayed the night before his crucifixion in Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. That cup of wine that every time he looked at reminded him of the impending agony and death. Can that cup pass from me? No. It can't. Mark says it like this, records the same passage we're reading here today like this. I must needs go to Jerusalem. I like that King James phrase, I must needs. It means I gotta, 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 gotta go. There is no other road for my life. This is the destiny, this is the fate, this is the purposeful plan of God. But it doesn't end with the crucifixion, it ends with the resurrection. Because I would be raised three days later. His dying leads to living. And his living gives us eternal life. That just as he's been raised from the dead, we will also. The thing that proves our Christianity that holds it all together is this resurrection. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, we're miserable because we're just playing games here. We waste a lot of time and money. But if he is raised from the dead... We've got the most glorious future one can imagine. His resurrection. Fourthly, let's just look at life now through eyes of eternity. Coronavirus is scary. It can bring about a lot of deaths. We don't know what the future holds. I am grateful that in this past week, we've been hearing that some of the deaths have started to slow down and new cases are slowing down and maybe God is blessing. Maybe finally all these measures are taking place. Maybe by the time Mother's Day rolls around, we'll be in here live together. We can hope. But through it all, this is what we realize, is that we're looking at life through a different set of eyeballs because of the resurrection. We don't just look at these 50, 60, 70 years. We don't just look at here and now. We don't just look at trying to accumulate the most toys so that we can win. When we went to Israel, when you blessed us with that trip, it's always interesting when you get on an airplane, you start taking off and you're flying over parts of cities. I remember it was uh, the morning we were coming back and we're flying over parts of Houston looking out the window. And you know them houses were big and it looked like every other house had a big swimming pool. And, uh, and then the plane had to go up a little bit because we were heading to Corpus Christi now from Houston. And suddenly those big old houses started looking smaller and smaller and smaller till they looked like, you know, little pieces of Lego or something. And they got smaller. And you suddenly realize, you know, when you're looking at it from heaven, those big old houses aren't so big. Those big old trials and tribulations, those big old concerns, those big old 
forces working against you. It looks so big right now. You look at it from heaven high up in the air. It ain't so big. This is what the resurrection does for us. Because we look at everything from eternity now. Not just here now. Yeah, we got to pay bills. We got to keep our heads above water. We got to struggle through this. But always in our mind is the fact that this is not my home. This is not the end. He's gone and prepared a place for us. That where He is, we will be also. The resurrected life means a whole new point of view from eternity. We've been saying that because of this here virus, we're starting to realize what's meaningful again. The threat of death, the threat of loss, the difficulty of getting through all of this. Yeah, it's helped us realize what is meaningful. But you know what? A lot of us already knew. Because when Jesus rose from the grave and He came into our life, we realized... For me, life is Christ. But death, death is gain. That's where all the prizes are. What about you? Are you ready to believe for this first time? You've gone through so much lately. Is there any hope here? Yes, there is. This man who is betrayed, condemned, rose on the third day. It looked like it was over for him and over for all his followers, but instead, his resurrection was that spark that, that lit up the whole world. More than any virus, more than any other contagi contagious thing, the love and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has spread through centuries, through cultures, and through continents. And it's coming to you right now. Today is the day. Are you ready to believe? It begins with a prayer of saying, yes, Lord, I'm ready for change. Yes, Lord, I believe you died on that cross for my sins and rose from the grave on the third day. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for change in your life? Because this story, that's about 2,020 years old, it'll change you. It might just be a spark, but it's the spark that's going to set off a flame in your life that's going to burn away all the old stuff that's held you back. And instead, give you a new life. If anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new person. Behold, all his old things, his old life, his old habits, his past, old things are passed away. All things are made new. Are you ready for the new start? Pray with me. Our Lord and our God, we love you so much. And I'm praying right now for anybody out there that, that is needing you right now and wants to give their heart to you. For the first time, this person is saying to you, Jesus, I need you. I need a new life. I need to be forgiven. I need to be cleansed. Let them know, Lord, that if they believe that when you were upon that cross, you were taking the punishment that we think we deserve. The condemnation of hell that we deserve. The condemnation and separation from God that we have merited because of our sin. You suffered it, Lord. Help them to see that. And that when you rose from the grave on the third day, you left all of that behind. All our guilt was laid upon you, and you left it in that grave. And we have a new life. Just if you have risen from the grave, we can rise to a new life. How? You told us, if we will confess with our mouth that you are our Lord, our Savior, and believe in our hearts that God raised you from the dead, we will be saved. I believe, Lord. Help this person also. Open their heart, their eyes, their mind, that they can say, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you died in my place. I deserved that condemnation, but you suffered it for me, and now I can have a new life. Thank you, Jesus, for rising from the grave. Thank you for giving me the hope of heaven. Thank you for Easter. We say these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and may God bless you on this special Easter. Hang in there. We know the end is coming soon, and we'll all be together again. Let's pray for that.